Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us virtually uh, via Zoom or uh, for being up in the Louise, our new event space here in Barry Hall. Um, great to know that there's a number of in-person audience members um, eating cheese today and uh, enjoying a really great conversation. The first conversation we've had this academic year in our Menard speaker series, which is sponsored by the Challey Institute here in the College of Business at North Dakota State University. Uh, I'm Scott Bollier, Dean of the College of Business. Uh, delighted to be moderating and uh, hosting our guest, Emily Oster, today. Again, we're thrilled to have you all here. Um, our lineup this year includes uh, Dr. Oster today. Uh, next month, Alice Marie Johnson, um, a, uh, a former um, prison convict who is out talking about her story of um, recovering and uh, the importance of criminal justice. In the spring, we have um, financial markets uh, commentator with Ann Saunders, along with Jason Riley from the Wall Street Journal. So the great lineup of speakers made possible through philanthropy, uh, the Menard um, family save big, save big money at Menard's, a local um, a business that many of you are familiar with made this possible. And uh, we're just uh, honored to uh, be able to bring in great guests. Without any further delay, um, our plan today is to um, have a conversation with Emily. I will moderate that for about 45 minutes to an hour, somewhere in that range. Uh, you are free to submit questions throughout uh, in the Q&A feature. It is uh, a feature that you can thumb, thumbs up or approve a question, and those questions will move to the top based on popularity. So please uh, uh, chime in. Uh, we'll try to get to your questions. And then the audience up in the Louise also will have a chance to ask Emily questions live in person. Try to keep those brief and succinct and to the point, um, but uh, feel free to step up to the microphone up there and uh, ask her a question. Uh, we have a great economist with us, a major public intellectual, uh, and it's a chance to engage her um, directly live and uh, in real time. So uh, Dr. Emily Oster comes to us from Brown University. She's a professor of economics at Brown, the author of three uh, really popular best-selling books, Expecting Better, Crib Sheet, and The Family Firm. She holds a PhD in economics from Harvard. Um, prior to being at Brown, she was on the faculty at the University of Chicago School, uh, Booth School of Business. Uh, Emily, thank you for being here. Uh, wonderful to uh, have you. Wish you could be in uh, North Dakota with us today. And uh, maybe I'll start there. Have you ever been to North Dakota? No, I have not been to North Dakota. I have worked with people from North Dakota. I have spoken a lot to North Dakota. One of my co-authors is from North Dakota, but I have never been to North Dakota. Well, we have so, to change that. One we, have one of, we have one of the largest um, Sons of Norway um, uh, community organizations, a lot of Norwegians here. I could take you to a restaurant across the uh, street and uh, you could experience lutefisk. So you need to come out and- uh, I have experienced lutefisk in my, in my life, Scott, and I'm not sure that you're selling. Lutefisk. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most a, selling. It's a great state. You get west, you can take the kids to the Badlands and uh, maybe hit <laughs> South Dakota too and uh, I'll work on your list of all U.S. states. Uh, um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so let's start there. You know, we went back and forth in preparation for this a little bit and uh, you know, North Dakota in November, December of last year was the worst place in the world um, for COVID-19. And I think we got, you know, somewhat of a wrap of um, geez, it's wild west out there. They they just they're letting anything happen. Um, but we came through it. It wasn't uh, real pretty, and uh, came out the other side. And our economy has been doing remarkably well. Um, we have um, observed a lot more in person student engagement. I wonder, as someone out in Rhode Island, when you look at um, North Dakota, what what you see in terms of how we're doing. It's interesting because I, you know, my exposure to North Dakota throughout the last year was really through the the schools. So I was I've been doing a lot of work on on in person on who was in person and what was going on in schools and um, and so I spent a lot of time talking to the people who run schooling in North Dakota and and you know it was it was uh, it was sort of interesting for for two reasons. Um, you know, one is that you guys have that that the state has a very well organized uh, functioning data infrastructure. Um, so we're actually continuing to do some work with North Dakota on schooling, partly because we realize like this isn't like a highly functional uh, uh, state infrastructure, which is which is great. Um, but it was also clear that you know in-person schooling was prioritized, and this kind of lined up with a, a lot of the the ways that sort of in-person schooling occurred last year, like lined up across states that that you know the sort of states that are more traditionally right-leaning, tended to open schools more than some of the, the states that were more traditionally 
uh, left leaning. Um, and I think that I was often use the word pragmatic at some point. Like I, like that is how I would have described all of my interactions uh, with school schooling in North Dakota from last year. So it's sort of an interesting word word to use. You know, I spent some time um, on Zooms with um, with a superintendent um, in the state who was sort of explaining, like, look, we're just we're doing our best. Like, it's really we decided it's really important for kids to be in person and to have in person learning, and we're doing everything we can to you know keep them safe and keep schools open and to protect our teachers. And you know, here's what we're what we're doing. But it was very it was a very kind of we think we know where we need to go. We're doing everything we can to get there kind of approach, um, which is quite different than some of what we sort of saw elsewhere. So it was, you know, everybody took a little bit of a different take on this, um, but uh, but that was kind of the, the North Dakota, that was the North Dakota pitch. Yeah, I wanna come back to some of the things you saw elsewhere because I, I have, um, you know, there's there's the hypothesis that people were really cautious. There's a hypothesis that people grew really comfortable with um, the new normal too. And I want to ask you about that in a little bit. But let's start with uh, for the audience members who don't know how you became this COVID public intellectual, just you know, somewhat um, unintentionally. And you know, what what are you doing in this space as an economist? Because that's part of the controversy. Is She's an economist. She doesn't know anything. I'm an economist too, and I don't know anything. Um, yeah. What are you doing, um, thinking and talking about COVID and collecting all this data? Yeah. So, so I sort of came into the into the pandemic. Um, I, you know, I'm a health economist, I, and I'm already like a, a sort of a little bit even pre-pandemic, like a slightly unusual profile because I do a lot of writing uh, for parents about parenting and pregnancy and interpreting data um, about decision making in those spaces. When I came into the pandemic, I was writing a, a newsletter. Um, I sort of started right before I was writing this like weekly or bi-weekly, some frequency newsletter for parents um, about, you know, I don't know, parenting data, things like that. And of course, like everything else, COVID sort of took over that. Uh, and I all of a sudden found myself inundated with parents' questions, which mostly were early on things like, can I send my kid to daycare? Like, is it risky to send my kid? Like, how many people at daycare have COVID? And then, you know, how many people at school have COVID? And when I looked out at the landscape of both research and policy, there was very limited effort to collect data or to get any systematic sense of what, uh, you know, what the, the COVID rates were looking like, what the COVID risks were looking like for kids in childcare, in, in schools. And I think where my sort of economist hat really came in here that was like a little bit different than the way some other people thought about this is when I looked out at the world last, in this, not last spring, no, 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 two springs ago, in the spring of 2020, and I looked at sort of what had happened with kids in school, it became immediately clear, even from seeing a small amount of data, that like this was a disaster. And that, that even that sort of three months, like you could see the, the learning losses, you could hear the stories of kids who were like in the, in the Zoom school, but also trying to take care of their, their younger siblings as their parents were like, it was clear that this was not working, was not working well. And so it seemed to me like cr crucial that we figure out, okay, can we get kids back to school safely? Because it's obviously very important that they be there. Uh, and as a person who trusts data, who sort of has, has a almost a perhaps too, too high a level of trust in data, but I was, you know, it seemed to me like the first question was just, okay, let's like learn something about how much COVID we're seeing in schools. And there was sort of no effort to do that. And so I got uh, into almost just through this kind of like, I, like I, I, I have to know this. And if somebody needs to do this, I guess nobody else is doing it. I guess we're going to do it. Um, I partnered with a number of other people and we sort of ended up building this kind of big dashboard of, of school data, which relied some on data we were collecting, but in the end sort of largely on data that, that states themselves were, were collecting. Um, and I, our role was like really to sort of put it out there and kind of interpret it a little bit for people and talk about what we were seeing. And I think part of what happened is we became, and I was sort of the face of this, like among the early people saying, you know, hey, actually in-person schooling can be done safely. Like when we look at schools, we're not seeing, they're not super spreaders. You know, it's not like, it's not the story that a lot of people wanted to tell in August, 2020, which was 
when you open schools, everyone's going to get COVID and it's going to, you know, it's going to be a, a sort of huge super spreader event. We just weren't seeing that. And ultimately that narrative has taken the day as we've gotten better and better and better data. Our data wasn't the best data that by, you know, by the end, I would, no one would say I had the best data, but we had the first data. I think we had something sort of early on and we were talking about it early on in part because we felt like the message of like prioritizing in-person school was, was really important that that was something that we needed to do for kids. And, uh, and that was sort of how I got to be the face of this movement to put people at school, which one would not think was controversial, but it was. So you, you might give spring of 2020 an F in terms of how we did nationally. Um, this fall, we were talking just before coming on, it seems like there's been a lot of learning. Maybe people have listened to you a little bit, but it seems to be going relatively well. That's at least my gut instinct out here. I don't know, what grade would you give um, just the school reopening in general right now? Like, like, a, C, like a C plus, I think. I give it like a C plus. Um, you know, I mean, I think what, there are, the thing that is really, that is really serving us well is that everybody has decided it is very important to have in-person school. And there were some moments in August when I was afraid we would be like stepping back on that, when I was afraid we would be back to like, oh, actually we, we're not. And that didn't happen. Like everybody opened, you know, almost now and including places that were not open at all for like the entire year last year. So I think that is really good. What isn't as good is there, the, the plans to open were presumed that there wouldn't be any COVID. Um, and so people are just like, oh, it's going to be fun. We'll just like do it regular. You know, we'll have a little bit extra HEPA filters. And then, of course, we sort of face Delta, and 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 that has meant that there are um, there are you know more cases and more questions about quarantine and just like more advanced planning would have been good. Um, you know, we we have no um, no plan for tracking school closures, for example. So like at some point in, in September, my sense is like the federal like education administration was like, oh no, we need to track school closures. Like we don't have any plan to do that. How could we do that? Um, and that's like not a great situation to, to be in. Um, and similarly, I think schools are finding themselves really uncertain about some of these quarantine procedures. You know, how much should I test? Are we test to stay? Are we quarantined? You know, it's like a lot of open questions. And I think that's left people with a little bit still of this sort of uncertainty and fear. And then of course there's the masking, which we really get into, which has like become a whole, a whole other thing. So, um, so, you know, I think all of those pieces could have been done better, um, but it's definitely maybe like a B minus, like it, the school, a lot of kids are at school. And I think that's pretty great. So one thing, you know, we were promoting uh, your, your talk this week a little bit and uh, a number of people in the community point to your framework um, that you have for just individually making decisions through COVID. I personally found it um, quite useful. You know, you, I, I remember being so scared spring of 20 and having a sick parent, like really sick and not knowing what is the right thing to do. And I, I'm an economist, I get the framework. I'm wondering if you can walk people through um, how you think about, you know, should I go to the bar and hang out at the bar for a couple hours versus spend time with a sick parent after quarantining and, you know, how you set that risk dial. Yeah, so, so I started talking about this largely um, sort of in, in kind of like May of, of 2020, when I think people were feeling just like almost just so overwhelmed with these kind of difficult questions. Um, and, you, you know, should I like, should I do this or should I do this? And how do these things trade off? And it was sort of back and forth and back and forth. So the idea of the framework is to say, hey, like in order to make one of these decisions, what you need to do is you really need, like you need a, a kind of a way to step through it. And so the first step uh, is to, to frame the question, to really, to actually say, you know, what, it, what are you choosing between? Um, and, you know, is the question, um, you know, in, should I see my sick parent today or, you know, next week? And I think er early on, a lot of the, I was talking a lot about childcare. Um, and people asking, you know, should I, and people would tell me, like, should I send my kid to daycare or not? And I would tell them, like, or not is not a childcare solution. Like, you can't answer that question until you tell me what is the other thing. And I think that for some people was like, oh, like, th there was almost a moment of like, I hadn't thought about it like that because I'm so focused on the one choice. 
And once you're so focused on that, it's very hard to you know, think about trade-offs. Um, so really sort of like, what are the one or two, what are the two or three, or, two, or what is the question? What's the question you're asking? And then in the COVID space, the next question is really sort of, how can I make this as, as sort of low risk as possible? And then how risky is that really? And that those two pieces sort of move, move together. But I, I, my sense is that in particularly in the risk evaluation piece, this continues to be fairly, in some ways, fairly important because and maybe it's maybe less true where you guys are, but here COVID is really salient. Like it's, it's the thing people are thinking about all the time. And when people ask me questions like, like, is it okay for my kid to go to the playground? You know, should, and, and, you know, I'm trying to talk them through, like you really need to actually get down to like what those numbers are, because we are not great at evaluating risk as people. And when risks are small, but not zero, they, they sort of take on a salience in our head. That's like, it, it's there and it's and it's hard to it's hard to ignore. And so by telling people, just sit down with the actual numbers and think about you know, how do they compare to other risks that you are taking. I must have spent like like weeks of my year talking to people about other risks that they're also taking um, and how this compares to those to those risks. Um, so you know, get all this information, think about the risk, and then make a decision. And this was this is sort of the the like other realization of some of these things that. Uh, even for these hard decisions where you cannot be sure that you are right and where you finish the decision and you feel potentially very crummy, that you, you, still, uh, you still need to make the decision. And that the, sort of the, sometimes all we can do uh, is decide, um, is, is feel that we have made the decision well. We cannot feel it is the right decision. And I think that, that realization uh, is a hard one, but sometimes it's the only thing that like kind of lets you move forward. And so the, the example is you know, I spent a lot of time talking about the choices to see parents, to see sort of family at the holidays last year. And I'm not sure that you know, the choices will be feel different this year, but maybe not that, that different. Um, and, you know, and, and in the end, I kind of came to me, I said, look, you know, there are only really two ways I could feel after making this choice. I could choose to see my family and then I will feel anxious the whole time. Or I cannot choose to see them and I can feel sad. And that's it. There's no secret option C where everything is great. There's only anxious or sad and you have to pick one of those. And in some sense, like what you're going to feel like that's it. That's a terrible, you know, it, this is very unfortunate, but it is almost impossible to choose if you haven't sort of gotten to that point because every, when you make one, you're like, oh, that's, well, that feels terrible. I feel anxious. Okay. I do that. Oh, well, I feel sad. I'm going to go back and forth. And, and the recognition that, you know, there isn't a great option, which is sort of the COVID, the COVID space that we're in. Yeah. Do you think um, you, your own contributions, do they seem very calm and logical to me and not that controversial in some respects? You know, like we need to get the schools reopened, the data on what happens to students who are not in school, it's ugly. And, uh, you know, there's dropouts at the teenage level. There's a real learning loss um, for young students. Do you think it's this risk piece that um, made you so controversial is any kid who might get long COVID or any kid who might die is too much risk to take? Like it's, it's just extreme, um, you know, just an inability to, to do the risk assessment. Is that, is that why it's kind of a hot, hot line of criticism for you or is there something else? Yeah. So I think it's sort of, two, there were kind of two things about the school. So one, you know, when I was talking about this last fall, I think it, it um, there was a sort of element that's sort of turned off here, which is there are a lot of high risk, like there were a lot of teachers who were at high risk, right? And it was, it was, uh, there was a lot of fear and even sort of telling people, okay, like schools are safe, but it's not like, that they're, it's not like no one, it, one could not say like no one has ever gotten COVID at schools. And I think that it, it was hard to, you know, work through the idea with people that like, okay, but there are other things you're doing, which are sort of in, like, there are some benefits of this. And I think particularly uh, on the teaching side, it, it felt, um, you know, it felt to some people like the, the sort of school reopening was pitting parents against teachers in some way. Like, you know, we want, you know, I want you to put yourself at risk or my, and that. So I think there was an element of, of that, which was really, where like really the underlying issue was, was sort of fear and fear that was outsized to the risk associated with schools, but was it really outsized to the risk associated with COVID for that individual? 
in this current, the sort of like, and, and, and I think the sort of criticism of what I've said has died down some, I guess, but, uh, but I think in this sort of current moment, when people think about kind of the, these controversies, I think a lot of the pushback is around um, kind of is stemming from having a, people having a very difficult time understanding the idea that, of small risks um, for kids and that any risk for kids seems like sort of infinitely big. And, and this is something I think about all the time in the context of like of, of other work, right? So when you think about choices that you're making with your baby or with your kid, totally independent of COVID, uh, as soon as somebody makes some, you know, real the sort of risk of really bad outcome salient, even if it's very small, that affects you as, as a parent. I think we think about our kids, you know, if somebody says, well, like, what if you're like, let me explain, like, you know, people could get long COVID, your kid could be in a brain fog. It's like, I don't like, I don't like, why would I make a choice that would, that would cause that? Like that's, you know, and I, I, and it's very difficult to step it back and say, well, actually there's other, you know, there's another side. There's a reason I send my kid to school. It's because it's important for their socio-emotional development, for their learning. It's because it's like what works for our, for our family. Um, and that's, that's the other side. But in the moment of the sort of, like, I'm afraid, and, and then it's very, it's very hard for that not to be the overwhelming feeling. Is there any point uh, in just watching the schools work on reopening that you said this is no longer about assessment of objective data and getting more good data into their hands. And it's about something else. I have a business graduate uh, who said, you know, it's really easy to shut down. You're going to have a heck of a time bringing people back. And I think there's some truth to that in higher ed. And, you know, it, it came to be um, something that teachers grew really comfortable with uh, in some places. San Francisco didn't even want to talk about it at school board meetings. They wanted to focus on the names on buildings instead of uh, talking about how do we get kids back to school. And, um, you know, did you feel like you were banging your head into a wall uh, at times on just having people look at the data and the facts? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, I think that's like, I think there were some, there were some moments in the last year where my, my like, you know, deep seated faith in the, in the, in the idea that people see data that like always make good, cho you know, good choices. That was really, it was shaking. Um, and, you know, and I think one part of that is, um, uh, was just the, the sort of like, yeah, the, the realization that data could not trump fear that, that this, that there was just like the, that even putting aside the politics, we're talking about in a second, that there was a point at which it just, it just like being told it's low risk and being shown numbers that was just like not doing and for some people, it's just like that. I, I, I'm sorry. Like, what? I don't want to see. Like, no, that's not. That's not. That's not compelling to me. I don't. I'm not. That's not the way that I think. And I think that was a, that was an important realization. Then there was this sort of side of it that was the that was the politics. Um, and I thought about that that sort of particular issue of of kind of it's hard. It's easy to shut it down. It's hard to open it up. That um, I thought about that a lot in the summer of 20. Because I sort of, I like, I think I wrote something in the summer of 2020 that was like, you got to open in September or you're not opening. And one of the things that happened in many districts in the U.S. is that they said, oh, well, you know, like Massachusetts happened a lot. They said, oh, we'll open in October. Like, we're going to give a few more weeks, more HEPA filters, whatever it is. And then the thing is, they didn't open. And part of that was the, you know, was the sort of like winter surge of last year. And part of it was that uh, was that it's very difficult to change what you're doing, um, and uh, and you know, particularly for schools that kind of make a lot of make a lot of investments, and so I think it became very difficult to transition um, to to transition back for both parents and you know my kids and for and for teachers, um, and you know we were in it was a sort of interesting space in this in kind of where I live. So I live in Rhode Island, and Rhode Island, our governor basically decided like we're having school. And she like in this in like June or July, she was like in the fall, we're opening schools. And she and they just, you know, at some point I asked the commissioner of education, like, how did you do that? You know, it's a really like democratic state. And and she was like, we just told people it's happening. Like we just told, we like told it, we told the unions and everyone else, we we're like, we're opening the schools. Let us know if you want to have any input, but anyway, they'll be open. Um, and they almost all were. Uh, and they almost all opened like the first week of September. And we also had like, like you guys, like a pretty big winter surge. And, but by then 
people understood people were not getting it at school. So there wasn't a lot of push. I mean, they closed a little bit. It's actually very similar in North Dakota. Like we closed a bit in sort of around the holidays and then open and then open back up. But I think by that point, people were like, well, my kid already goes to school. They really like it. It's like there nobody's really getting COVID at this school. So we're just going to kind of keep going. And Massachusetts sort of didn't open and then just had a very hard time opening. Uh, last COVID question. Uh, you know, I, I saw you out this week talking about the five to eleven um, vaccine, and you know the promise that that um, holds, and then also some smart policies on uh, or smart ideas on. You know, right now here in North Dakota, if someone tells you that they were a close contact, then you have to deal with uh, quarantining, um, even in the schools. And I think you've been doing some work on if you can demonstrate your negative let the kid back into school. And uh, I, I'm just wondering what your, when you look out a couple of months, uh, are things coming back to normal even more so than now? Yeah, so I think, I am hoping. Um, I, you know, I think we really need to make some progress on the quarantine and I am optimistic that that will happen. Um, you know, there, I don't know why the CDC has been slow on this. Um, I could have said that like so many times in the last year, but okay. Um, but I think that what the, what it is pretty clear what they need to do, which is advocate some version of this test to stay, where if you're a close contact and a sort of an unvaccinated close contact, you can rapid test every, you know, every day or every other day or whatever, and you can stay, stay in school rather than quarantine. The reason that I'm pretty confident that that's a good idea is that we have randomized trial evidence suggesting that it is just as good as quarantine uh, in the context of, of a Delta outbreak in the UK. So, you know, it, it's like, this is sort of a no brainer. My guess is that once we have really reliable rapid test access in a month or two, we will get to that. And I think that will be great. I also think once vaccines for kids are approved, that will really change things, even though I anticipate vaccination rates being relatively low, because I think it will, it will mean that it is an option. And so there is a, there is a sort of narrative, a, a kind of set of things where there are, there are people who, for whom this is a really important thing. Like this is something that is, that is, is very important for them to feel safe. There are other people who are more skeptical of vaccines for kids. And I think it's, you know, it's certainly more complicated calculus than for an, than for an older, uh, than for an older adult. But the fact that people will be able to vaccinate their kids uh, will change how people feel the same way the fact that, you know, once we were able to vaccinate older adults, it changed how people feel. And doing that in combination with boosters and the sort of waning of the Delta wave, I think will probably push us to more normalcy. That's great. So shifting gears, um, you know, I want to thank you for uh, your your family books. I, I love them. My uh, wife has read them. And um, if I can get my wife to read uh, economics, it's always a win. And uh, she enjoys them. <laughs> Um, she and I actually are expecting um, a kid in uh, December and we're rusty. It's been like six years since our last one. Uh, so we're going back. Uh, she was re reading crib sheets um, this week, actually. And I want to just um, run through um, some of your bottom lines in these rather quickly and uh, you know, just uh, hit on them. I, I, you know, I'm rusty with that book. I read it in 2013 or 14, I think. I found it awesome because some of the things that we did um, as parents without that book were kind of consistent with what you were saying, just moderation and being reasonable. We were in Italy um, for a baby moon for um, our second kid and had a, my wife had a glass of wine and oh no, the, the sky didn't fall and we have a, a brilliant little girl, you know, and I, um, I appreciate um, just this calm message that you, um, that you offer after looking at a lot of the data. And I just want to dig in and, um, you know, just for people who aren't familiar with your work, um, what's the bottom line on things like coffee, alcohol, tobacco, deli meats? Um, should we have a lot of these things during pregnancy? Uh, so it depends a little bit which of those things you're talking about. I mean, you know, in the in the in expecting better, uh, I I try to go through a lot of these lifestyle style things because I think, in a sense, like as a as a pregnant person, that's kind of like the first thing that you're that you're encountered encountered with is, is this like list of things that you can't do. And part of what was frustrating for me was they were not ranked. You know, it'd be like, don't have any salami and also don't smoke cigarettes. I don't know, are those the same? Like, is it for the same reason? Are they the same thing? And, and you know, so I, I really like dive kind of down into, into each of these 
uh, into each of these things. And in some cases, um, the answer like salami, it's sort of like, yes, salami is fine. Um, you know, salami is fine. Um, and then in, in some of them, like alcohol and coffee, um, you know, more so alcohol than coffee, the, their answer is sort of like, you know, a, a small amount in moderation. It doesn't look like it is, it is bad there. You, of course, can overdo it, particularly in the case of alcohol. You should consume excessive alcohol, probably to a lesser extent true of, of coffee. But, you know, that there's a, there's, a, there's a power in sort of understanding why you would be concerned and what the evidence says about, you know, you know, levels. And then when you turn to something like smoking, this actually looks like smoking is fairly dangerous, um, you know, even at relatively low, uh, low levels. So there's a sort of, there's a, in some sense, an argument for like, you should get a rank list, which is like, here are some things you definitely shouldn't do. Here are some things where like, you want to cut down. And like, here are some things which we used to tell you, you shouldn't do like, but actually are fine, like sushi, uh, like sushi and deli, deli ham. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I'm, again, six years removed from it, um, but the advice is basically like barely live. You know, you if you uh, you do a little bit here and there, that's uh, that's okay, but anything that's fun, you might as well just kiss Don't do fun. You know, Don't have yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, you know, how about exercise uh, during pregnancy? Um, you know, there's, there's old wives tales out there that you just really shouldn't wait in pregnancy and all of this. What What's the bottom line on that? Yeah, it just turns out that exercise is is good, uh, or at least you know if you are exercising be before you can continue to exercise. And I think we've seen some like pretty amazing like Olympic level athletes who have continued to compete at more or less a world class level until they're they're quite pregnant. Um, and you know there are some things which again it's sort of like there are some things you shouldn't do, like you should go skiing because it, if you fall down, that's really you know, shouldn't fall down. No tackle football. But if the question is like, can I do CrossFit? Yeah. Can I go running? Yeah, actually until, you know, until really, until really late. And so I think, again, it's, there's so much of pregnancy that is, appears to be about a sort of excessiveness of, of caution. And it's not that you don't want to be cautious, but it's also, um, it, we almost get into a place where like, anytime anybody suggested that you should do anything that like it, making your life worse in it, in it could be like, you make your life infinitely worse, it would be worth it for a tiny benefit for the for the baby. And I think that that, that kind of messaging that really in line with the data. Yeah, we've gone through the uh, the testing phase with this one too. And that is just one massive um, blood pressure through the roof experience because their their offices are basically designed to find things that are issues, you know, and they, yes. they speak in Greek and then you go home and you realize this is really a small risk and uh you or do we don't do know that. anything about it, yeah, yeah, right? Like, you know, well, we like could, could be it's like, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of like, well, if you're like, why did you look for it? Mm -hmm. Why are you looking for it? Yeah, on, uh, on, you know, on delivery methods, are there any findings, bottom line findings, um, that you have there to just support one approach versus another, or you know, is it kind of just you whatever mean in like, in like, should you have a c section? Yeah, I mean, should you have a C-section? Should you induce? Um, should you go the distance? Should you try to aim for an early delivery? Any, is there any evidence yeah. of anything good there? I mean, this is a sort of interesting, it's just an interesting space because one of the very few things in this pregnancy uh, area where one can really like dive into randomized trials where you can actually have like good randomized, um, sort of good randomized data that tells you, that tells you something. And um, and, you know, we get to sort of the most recent thing was in the, in the sort of last few years, uh, there was a large randomized trial that came out that suggested that people should be induced at 39 weeks that not that they should be, but that, that, that was like a reasonable approach. Um, and one of the, one of the sort of, as a kind of as an economist, as a researcher, things I find most interesting about results like that is that was like a big trial. And really what it said was if you, uh, you know, if you, if you would like to be induced at 39 weeks, it does not appear to raise the risk of a C-section. People worry that if you sort of induce early that people will be more likely to get a C-section that didn't show up in the data. The outcomes in terms of C-section rates, outcomes for the baby were basically all the same. But that gets in sort of, that gets then kind of fed through a medical system where it comes out on the other end with people being told everybody should get induced at 39 weeks, which of course is like not, not true. It, it, this is really a thing that says like you should give people a choice, and these are like sort of both reasonable options. And and I worry, 
that basically anytime we have good data or any data, good, bad, in this, in this space, we want to convert it to rules. And in, in many ways, this is, this is sort of how I use a lot of the pushback that I, I have in the books. It's just the idea that like, no, like we shouldn't have rules. We should have information and practices and people should be like making those choices for themselves. On the, on the C-section piece, I don't remember this in any of your um, work, but you know the, there are hospitals within the U.S. that are extraordinarily high in C-section rates. Like just, they have to be explained by doctors being biased towards that. And then the U.S. as a country is extremely high um, relative to the rest of the world. And any, any um, analysis on the long-term harms from, to people from doing, going that route um, electively? So there's a, a from the standpoint of, of sort of infants, um, the the kind of uh, outcomes for for babies are very similar. You know, it's not it's not an issue. The main downside of a C-section is uh, is that the reco- the sort of immediate recovery is longer. And if you want to have many kids, uh, there's kind of a, a limit to have, like the the sort of complications in later pregnancies are are greater um, for reasons that sort of phys- physiologically make um, make sense. Uh, but you're you're right that the that the sort of C-section rates in the U.S. are really variable across hospitals, are extremely high, and in many cases appear to reflect uh, things other than risks than the actual like like I mean effectively there are some reasons we should do a C-section like the baby is breached probably that needs a C-section in most cases um, you know other kinds of complications um, and then some things can happen in labor such that it doesn't progress and you need to do a c-section but that you know we sort of generally think that should be like 15 percent like that shouldn't be 45 percent of of births and you can sort of see in some of these pieces of data that like sort of near the end of a shift you get you know like five o'clock you get a lot of c-section you get sort of you see things that make it look like people don't want to wait um, and i think that's that's where you start wondering like okay what could we, you know, how could we change incentives um, to make this happen? There's actually a lot of interesting stuff about like reinforcement incentives for, for sort of C-sections versus vaginal births, which uh, probably explains some of this. Yeah. Uh, turning to actual birth of the kid, um, you know, I, my first child was in 2010 and we came home naive after, you know, the, the required, I don't know, it was 48 hours or something and thought, I can't believe they let you leave with it, right? I was just like, oh my God, why did you let me take this home? (laughs) And, you know, just thought like it was going to be from the movies. You hold this little sweet thing and it sleeps all the time. And she was alert and she was like in the eight to 10 hours of sleep per day maximum. So that's a lot of jolly in the rest of the time. And uh, six weeks later, it was still like that. And we we went down the road. You mentioned this book, uh, Baby Wise, which some people think is baby torture, we went down that road and um, it got our first child on track and saved our lives. Our pediatrician said, nobody's ever uh, died that I know of from like sleep deprivation uh, in the early years, but you know, try to get some. Uh, and uh, you, you nonetheless find that it's um, not like sleep training and uh, you know, just various sleep tactics aren't buying you that much. Is that kind of the bottom line? So I think sleep training, like, so sleep training does improve the sleep for your for your kid. I mean, there's a sort of short-term, long-term piece of this, which is like eventually everybody sleeps, which is of course hard to hear when you have like a two-week-old. Um, and and you know, it is true in the data that that sleep training sort of versions of these cry out methods do uh, improve both infant and parental and parental sleep. They're not like a panacea; they don't improve it. You know, it doesn't doesn't improve it a thousand percent, but for most for most babies, that will improve their sleep. A lot of people worry that you know that there are kind of like long-term harms from letting your baby cry, and, and that doesn't seem to be supported in the data. You know, when you look at these kids five, six years later, you kind of can't tell. You can't tell whether who was sleep trained, who was not sleep trained, even in in randomized data. So, this is again one of these like parents, and actually almost everything in crib sheet has the flavor of like you should do the thing that works for you because actually all of these things are fine. Um, or you know, and so some. Sleep training is not for everybody. Yeah, we, you know, we were kind of old school and just said the, the kid needs to be in a crib. It needs to be in another room. Um, way too noisy and I can't take it in uh, yeah. in my room. But then there's people who co-sleep and are um, sleeping with their kid for several years. And I, yeah, I, I guess it works for them. Like you just, I can't even put that hat on and imagine it. 
Yeah, no, and I think one of the the sort of humbling aspects of of writing uh, of writing poetry for me is like I'm like a tremendously bossy person, um, and and like all uh, like all parents feel that the ways that I did it are things other people need to know about. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have a, a lot of these tendencies people are like, what should I, what should I do? And I'd be like, okay, let me tell you, here's what you do. And like, just follow, like, here's my like list of things, you know? And when I sort of came out on the other side of crib sheet, I actually try much more deliberately to not tell people what to do. I still do it a lot of the time, but, um, but to sort of recognize that like actually so much of the choices that I made are really about the preferences that I had and not about there being like a, like a right thing to, to do. And, and, you know, that's, um, that's been very humbling. I'm assuming the most controversial one is breastfeeding, right? That, uh, you know, the, the impacts of breastfeeding are tremendously, they're, they're sold to you as you've got to do this. Like, you know, the, the baby's going to turn out to be super man or woman yeah. if you breastfeed, if you don't, um, you're just not up with contemporary times and a lot of other bad yeah. things. Um, your your findings in that area yeah so the the rhetoric around breastfeeding as you say is like so is so extreme and when you dig into the data in, in, in the sort of the reasons why our selection are sort of the kinds of reasons we're all like very familiar with which is the the sort of set of moms who who choose to breastfeed are um you know, very different from the set who do not and when you look at something like FEQ um, you're seeing, you know, huge differences and they're not totally ameliorated by, by sort of controlling for basic demographics of the mom, although they're partially, partially addressed, but, you know, basically there's just a selection problem, like a huge selection problem. Uh, when you dig into the better data, data that comes from some randomized trials or sibling fixed effects or, you know, things that, that just do better on causality, what you find, uh, is that, um, is that uh, you know breastfeeding does seem to have some benefits, short-term benefits to digestion, like and to maybe to ear infection. So some sort of small stuff about sort of early on health. Um, but that all of this kind of long-term, your kid will be smarter, they'll be thinner, they'll be more successful. Like, all like all that stuff is just is just selection. I think that takes off a lot of the pressure because I think if you you know we sort of say breast is best, okay. But if you said like, but, but what I mean by best is that your kid will have like one potential, you know, is expected to have one fewer gastrointestinal infection in their first year. That's like a very different meaning of best than like five IQ points. And I, I think that, you know, it's kind of like, like help people make choices based on the actual data. Yeah, uh, a couple of other ones that uh, that you cover, um, you know, just some of the things that we try to throw at early development for kids, you know, whether it's uh, baby Einstein toys or, you know, just um, special schooling to make them smarter, um, you know, early, like having them pick up a language or sign language really early um, impacts of all of that stuff. I find my sort of my favorite question people ask me is like, is like, you know, which preschool philosophy should I choose? There's the Montessori and there's the Reggio Emilia. And here's how people will like go into their sort of like, uh, like trade-offs between those, between those things. And I always just tell them once you're at the point of thinking about what is the right preschool philosophy, it doesn't matter. It's not like we don't have any data, but also like you are already like, like you're, you're, it's already, you've already achieved, you know, the, the things. Um, and I, I, in some ways, I, it, there's a little bit of attention because we know that sort of early childhood, like zero to three, zero to five is super, super important for kids. And it is the source of a lot of inequality, sort of inequality that persists for the whole life cycle. So it's not exactly saying that like early childhood doesn't matter. It's just that once you're in this sort of, once you've already crossed over into like being the person who's asking about the preschool philosophy, then you've already, you know, made, you've already done the things that are, you, yeah, you've already I, done the things. I, I remember uh, Steve Levitt, author of Freakonomics, had this finding that was reading to your kid probably doesn't matter, but having a lot of books in your house does. And I think it's to your same point, having a lot of books in your house indicates that you're probably reading and that they're probably just going to be in a high achieving household um, anyway. And uh, and it sounds like a similar type of thing. I will say though, actually we do have some evidence that reading to your kid, there is some randomized evidence that reading to your kid matters. Okay, good, that's good news. I mean, it was one of the things I wanted to get to and uh, I will in a minute, but 
whether I should take from you optimism or pessimism about what I'm capable of as a parent, but we'll get to that in, uh, okay. in one minute. Um, screen time, um, any thoughts on, I mean, my, my kids are now entering, you know, phones and, uh, um, you know, computer time, any strong findings on any of that yet? So our data on screen time is poor. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of good evidence on, you know, the, the impacts, to the extent that we have it, it looks pretty, you know, it looks pretty neutral, but I actually, I spent a lot of time sort of in the pandemic and in writing it, all of these books, thinking about screens. I think that basically the right way to think about screens is that they are a substitute for something else. I think we, we imbue screens with this idea of them being like, we have to, are they good? Are they bad? You know, are they, are they, they're, they're this bad. You know, it's like there's some inherent badness. Uh, and rather than putting that on, I think a much there's a much more neutral frame, which is if my kid is, you know, watching television for four hours a day, there's a lot of other things that they're not doing. And that it's not that the television is inherently bad. It's just if they sat in the room and stared at the wall for four hours a day, I would also be like, hey, maybe you should go outside. Um, and that when, when we think about television, we think about screens in general, that what we really want to be doing is thinking about them, sort of where do they fit in? Where is the time that, that it sort of makes sense? I'm sorry. You're fine. I forgot to silence. It's okay. Um, where is the time that this is going to fit in, uh, to our, you know, to our, our family life. And I will say like my kids watch TV every day, um, which wasn't true before the pandemic. Um, but you know, they watch TV and they watch TV in like the 45 minutes sort of before dinner, because, you know, we need time to kind of set up, but also they need some decompression time. And it's just become very clear to us that if everybody has a little bit of like alone time before dinner, dinner is much nicer, that like family dynamic is much better. And it's not that they would be better off doing homework that would actually make it make things worse. So a, uh, just a kind of a wrap up. Um, series of questions here. A lot of your findings are, um, it depends, or, you know, they can be thought of as like, you know, you've busted a myth. Is there anything strong that you say you absolutely ought to do um, as a parent? I'm headed into it for the, um, for the fourth time here. And I'm, I'm wondering like, okay, don't smoke during pregnancy. Um, you should probably get vaccinated, you know, like the different vaccines. Yeah. Um, that, that Childhood offer. vaccines. You should introduce er allergens early. Okay. Um, you should give your kids, that's like one of the main, like one of the most compelling pieces of empirical that's, data. That's right. uh, you should introduce allergens yep. early. Kids need a lot of sleep. Mm -hmm. That's like in the, in the that's, a, that's another, kids need a lot of sleep, probably more mm -hmm. than you think. <laughs> sleep is important. And anything strongly that you should not do, I mean, the, don't smoke. Um, a lot of your others are kind of in this, it depends, like it, and, and I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, I think there's not a, like, of course there are things that you can do that are not like, that, you know, there are ways to behave with your kid, which are obviously not, not okay. But in terms of, of sort of, are there, are there things, you know, that are just like, if you teach them in this way or do this, like, no, I mean, I think there's very little, very little stuff. And so that's, that's, I guess, my bottom line question on my own role as a parent. I had a friend when we first became kids say, you know, it's pretty easy. Keep them alive. They'll turn out all right. You know, and is there, is that kind of a bottom line takeaway from um, your work in, in some senses, relax, um, the kids are all right. And uh, we've overdone it here on, on all of this worry on different dimensions. So I think that is... In I think there's a, yeah, there's a piece of, of, you know, particularly crib sheet that I think is, is sort of has that frame. When I think about this older kid period, which is sort of more about the, the new book, I think there's a, there's a little bit more of, of kind of, not that there's something that's very important to, to do or not do, but that you should think about what you want the interactions, what you want your kids to be doing and how you want your life to be organized in a way that is um, that is deliberate. And that's different from saying that you need to obsess about there being a correct way to do it or not, but just that if you want to have a life that looks a particular, like that looks like what you want, then you actually have to craft that on like deliberately and on and on purpose. Um, and that it kind of is some work. It's not that it's it should be like anxiety provoking, but it's kind of it's like a it's like a thing you have to do on purpose. 
Yeah, so I want to transition to the uh, the new book. My wife and I were saying um, we uh, we need to come up with a family plan. We're a little overcommitted in the fall, and this happens. Yeah. I don't know about Rhode Island, but we're we're trying to squeeze as much out of life in the nice remaining month that we get, and then it gets cold and dark, and we do less. You know, so we feel like we're over constrained um, right now. But before getting there, um, you know, just one more question on we've combed so much um, different data and literature in forming these, um, you know, these findings in different areas. This matters, this doesn't. How do you stay current in the event there's new studies that come out or, you know, like all of a sudden there's the finding that overturns or comes up with that unicorn scenario for breastfeeding, like the, the, the um, random controlled study that says, yep, oh, it boosts IQ by 10 or something. How are you keeping an eye on all of that? Um, so part of what's great about having this newsletter is other people keep an eye on it for me. So if there's something very large, I always hear about it. Um, but you know, I spend a lot of time like partly trolling for newsletter topics, but partly just like sort of looking, looking through, um, you know, looking through academic literature because that's part of my, that's part of my job. But I also think the, the other part of it that's very important is it's actually not that common that something would come out that would be so important that it would like overwhelm other things that we um, that we already know, right? You sort of think of the way that like a literature works or a, a, a kind of set of findings work. There's some pretty large body of evidence that already exists. And so it's, I think sometimes people think about this, like each individual new result is gonna have, you no, know, actually very few results are sufficient to kind of overturn something we, we sort of thought from a wide body of literature. Um, and so I think that's, that takes a little bit of that, that pressure off. That's great. So your new book is uh, just out. I know you've been doing the uh, the book um, talk thing all over the place. And uh, what what's the the bottom line? You've got another framework for parents in uh, that book. And uh, yeah, can you talk so about this it a little is, bit? this so this book is really about the the sort of early early school years. Um, and there's a lot of it shares similarities with the with the earlier books. There's a lot of data um, around in this case older kids sleep nutrition, school choice, extracurriculars. So thinking through some of those things with data, but most the sort of first part of the book is, um, is really this, this framework and the idea that, um, that in this era of parenting, we are often faced with decisions that we didn't expect. And there is an overwhelming sort of logistical kind of, there is an overwhelming role of logistics in, in a lot of our, our lives. And that, uh, that it is an opportunity to think about crafting the, the sort of life that we want, the structure that we want. Uh, and there's a framework, which actually very similar to the COVID framework um, around the kind of decision-making, which says, you know, when you're facing a complicated decision, you wanna frame the question, you wanna collect data, you know, plan to make a decision at a concrete time, think explicitly about follow-up. So in some sense, it's a, it's a sort of toolbox book with some data to, to I don't know, help people manage um, I don't ma like manage their yeah. manage their parenting. I guess. Yeah, it's, it's great. I haven't uh, had a chance to look at that um, yet, but looking forward to it. And I believe we're giving away copies um, upstairs in this space where they're eating cheese and uh, and hanging out. Cheese so, and I, and workbook pages. It's yes, a great right. combination. Yeah. Uh, so final question for you, and it's a little bit um, away from your your actual work and more about you as a as a person, and it's. Um, yeah, as a dean, I would love to have um, more academics like you who are bridging their work into public intellectual audiences, and you just get high impact for that visibility. Um, I'm curious, it, it, it's not typical, though. Um, you know, a lot of academics just, the, the overwhelming majority hang tight in their offices. They talk to other academics and do important work and don't ever want to stick their neck out. And then you've done it, and uh, I mean, it's it's doesn't seem like it's always pleasant. So why do you why do you do it, and uh, what's motivating you there to just be a, a public voice on some of these topics? So I mean, I think there's there are sort of different pieces of that. I I I, I really like to write. So and I really like the pro like more than almost anything I do in my research. I like the process of trying to translate what we're doing as academics into a into a broader audience like the process of doing that which is something I think many academics do not like um, that is the piece that I I both like and also think that I am like relatively better at 
And so I think for me, some of it is just some of the answer is just like I, I, I do this stuff because I because I like it, even though actually the professional incentives are really weird. Um, and it's not obvious that that sort of having a profile like mine is like the best professional uh, is the best professional professional option. It's certainly like pretty, pretty atypical. Um, you know, in the, in the case of, so that's a sort of answer to like, why would you write these books, which mostly are, you know, they have their controversial moments, but like mostly are pretty even in terms of just, you know, controversy. Um, the, the more complicated question for me is like, why would you do this COVID, like COVID stuff and sort of, and, and be so public. And, and there, I think I, I both, I sort of hadn't, and I don't regret it, but I think I hadn't realized when I took that on, like what it would turn into in terms of, of kind of controversy, but also it, I felt like I had to, and I don't know how else it's really to say that, like it felt to me like this was important. Uh, and, you know, as the time went on, it only felt sort of more like that. And I think that, that as I did more of what really ended up being in some ways like advocacy, I think part of that was the feeling that like we're really we're really making a mistake, like we're messing this up and we're hurting kids, and that we and I think that that kind of pushed me on, even though those moments were very uncomfortable. That's great. So we're going to turn to some audience questions here, and uh, the first one's going to come from Zoom, and then we're going to see if there's anyone um, up on uh, uh, up at the podium upstairs in a second here. Um, Emily, you're one of the biggest reasons I became a health economist, huge fan. What do you think is the most misleading health guideline or recommendation the CDC makes and why? Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure that it would be that easy to pick out like a, like a single recommendation. I, I think that there is a, um, a broad issue with a lot of the recommendations that come out of, CD, out of the CDC in the space of COVID and pre-COVID. Uh, which is that they they are extremely black and white, and often and really really fail to uh, to sort of explain the um, the kind of nuance behind the recommendations. So you'll get some things that seem you know really extreme. So like last a couple of years ago, the CDC came out with a recommendation that said that women uh, of like more or less like women of childbearing age, like women who could be pregnant, should not drink any alcohol at all. Now, I think reasonable people could have different views about how what the CDC recommendation should be on drinking in pregnancy, but to sort of say that like basically women between 18 and 49 should never have any alcohol because they could possibly be pregnant is like, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Like it's not a recommendation anyone can follow. And I think sometimes they're sort of missing the kind of like, like you're speaking to people aspect of this um, and that there's so much of an effort to want to be like, to, to just want to simplify the message rather than saying, you know, here's the uncertainties we have and let's communicate them. And I think we've seen that a lot in the COVID space as well. We've seen the, you know, the, the masking recommendations are sort of the most obvious where it's kind of, it's felt to people very lurchy um, when the, the data may not be as lurchy as, as sort of the, the messaging has been. Thank you. Uh, I see the Louise, which is our room upstairs. Uh, are there any questions from up there? Uh, yes, I'm going to start us off with questions and hopefully we'll get a line, line of people after this. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Emily, for being here. We really appreciate this. This is great. Uh, I'm just wondering, you talked a little bit about screen time, but I'm wondering, have you looked at social media at all and, uh, you know, limiting social media or the impacts that social media has on kids? Thank you. Yeah, so I looked a little bit at this as kind of like the last thing in the in the book. Um, the the sort of issues around, issue around social media is that it is... Um, it is it, it, like, it depends. Um, and so it's different from saying it doesn't matter, um, but it, it is tremendously variable depending on what your, like, what your kid is like, basically, and what they, are, uh, what they are struggling with. So it can be actually a really good thing for some kids, a sort of way to connect, a way to just sort of meet people who are outside of their peer group, who are like, maybe they connect with better. It can also be really bad. Uh, and you know, really damaging um, for uh, for kids. And we've seen some of this come out recently in some of the Wall Street Journal reporting about Facebook. So there's some academic literature on this. There's also some like you know Facebook specific stuff about this, particularly around Instagram and and girls. And I think that's that's pretty consistent with what we what we think of in the um, in the in the data uh, in the academic research. And so I, in, you know, in some sense, 
where this comes down for me, you know, as a parent, when I think about the inevitable time that my child will ask for uh, a phone with Instagram on it, um, is that there, there is no substitute for learning about it from your own child. And that there's a, there's a sort of a, almost an experimental, like an argument for experimentation to say, look, you know, at some point you're going to make the decision to do this. But the thing that would be the mistake is to decide to do it and not have an explicit plan for revisiting how it's going. Because you are not going to be able to tell ex ante whether this is going to be a problem for your kid or not, but you really wanna be able to have an idea of ex post, how are you gonna think about this? And so I think that's a little bit of this kind of part of this decision-making process, just having a plan to like follow up. Okay, great, thank you. As we wait for someone else uh, upstairs, another uh, question from you, uh, for you in the chat here, uh, wondering, and I, I failed to cover this, but wondering about uh, paid maternity, paternity leave, um, either comparisons within the U.S. or comparing the U.S. to other countries, any evidence that this, um, you know, helps outcomes, it looks like. Yeah, so we actually, have, uh, we actually, yes, we have a fair amount of evidence um, that paid parental leave, um, particularly uh, sort of or like sort of some, any, uh, is Im improves outcomes for uh, for babies, uh, you know, up to and including uh, reductions in infant mortality. Um, but you know, certainly infant health and and other things, you know, those uh, those effects accrue, you know, in this like with leaves of you know like up to sort of four months when you go from like four months to a year, which is um, sort of the, the kind of a year would be closer to the sort of European model. You don't see as many of those um, of those kind of kind of benefits, but we have just a lot of evidence that having some paid parental leave early on is, uh, is, is really good for babies and, uh, and, and parents. And, you know, it is notable that like everybody else has it. Um, you know, the U S is among the very, very few, places without a sort of consistent set of, of paid parental leave. Some states have it, some, some states don't. So I think that's, um, there's a, we should be having that. Thank you. Uh, back to the Louise, I see someone else at the mic. If you wanna uh, give us your name too. Hi, I'm Rachel Thompson. I'm an accounting faculty and mom of two. So, <laughs> so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the research on face masks a little bit more and specifically with respect to kids and if there's a certain age where it becomes beneficial versus less beneficial. So, um, sure. So we don't, um, let me think about how to, how to frame this. Uh, there's a lot of variation globally in the masking choices that people make for children. Um, and so, you know, face masks are very common in the, in the U S and we, there are, you know, the sort of recommendations are to mandate them as, as young as two, um, the WHO act, I think sort of explicitly says they should not be mandated under, under the age of, they should not be worn under the age of five. Um, and you know, most of Europe is not engaged in the kind of masking approaches that we are, that we are taking here. So that's, you know, there, so it's not, it is not something about which there is uniform agreement across, um, across locations. We don't have a lot of direct evidence on the efficacy of masks for kids. When we sort of think about like what, what kinds of evidence do we have around masks? We have uh, very good sort of general like science evidence that like if you, you know, based on like, you know, aerosol, like spraying, you know, like the, the mechanics, we have evidence on the mechanics. Um, we have uh, epidemiological evidence suggesting that in places where there were mask mandates, we saw uh, lower, you know, lower rates of COVID. Now, is it causal? I don't, you know, people could argue about that. We have that. And we actually have one, you know, big RCT in Bangladesh, which showed some benefits of encouraged masking uh, largely occurring to older, to older people. When we look at evidence on masking in schools in particular, um, you know, there it's a little complicated. Uh, a lot of the best data we have suggesting that schools can operate safely, um, most of which is pre-Delta, uh, is like with detailed contact tracing data and so on. Almost In almost all cases, those schools were, were fully, in, in all cases, those schools were fully masked. So there's not really a comparison. Uh, in some of our research, you know, not research, in some of our data hub, we were able to do a little bit of comparison across districts in, in Florida 
we didn't find a big effect of mask mandates, but that's a little different than effective masking. So I, it, it, like in some sense, like the answer is kind of, we don't know. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and we don't know that much about whether there are any negative impacts that particularly look like it. On the other hand, I think, you know, a reasonable person could point out that like it may be harder to learn to learn to read. So, you know, I th this is a space where I just feel like because we don't know enough and it's frustrating. It, it's so political that it seems like we're not going to be able to learn the answer, which is part of what's frustrating. Okay. Well, thank you, Emily. Another question from uh, the Zoom Q and A. Um, uh, someone's ten weeks pregnant. Uh, she's vaccinated. Wants to know if she should be more worried. Um, now that she's pregnant and vaccinated around others than otherwise. And then a follow-up to that um, is, uh, uh, should I get vaccinated while pregnant? Okay, so um, so on the, on the sort of first question about, about kind of being cautious, if you are pregnant, um, there is always a value to being slightly more cautious than you would be about, it would be like otherwise about illness because you are slightly immune compromised. And so I think, I think given the vaccine with COVID, I would treat it like that in the sense that like, you know, if you were pregnant and we were having a very bad flu season, I think many doctors would be like, Hey, you may, you know, you want to be careful. My guess is now people would be like, oh, maybe you like wear a mask a little bit, you know, a little bit more frequently. Um, but you know, should you, should you sort of think of yourself as like, you know, an, like an elderly, like a, like a 90 year old, like, no, the immune compromise is not that significant. Um, I think, you know, this is the vaccine has kind of drawn down COVID into the space of being like the flu. And so you should act like you would if the flu was, was around more than it is. Um, if you were pregnant, you should get vaccinated. Absolutely. In fact, like it, pregnancy is like a good reason to get vaccinated in and of itself because some antibodies will probably pass to the baby, but also pregnant women are at higher risk for serious COVID. Thank you. Uh, back to the Louise for uh, someone at the podium. Yeah, my name is Micah Onrud. I'm a senior in agriculture economics here. Uh, I had a question. We've been talking a lot about kind of, I guess, methods of parenthood. Uh, I had a question more about maybe the environment, uh, such as evidence that uh, uh, touches the subject of like one parent versus two parent household in those early developmental years. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so, you know, in the, um, there's a sort of facile answer, which is like in the data, uh, you know, we see, um, you know, we single parent households, kids tend to get, you know, tend to get less education, ultimately and tend to, to sort of have worse test score output. Like there's not that many things we can measure, but that is certainly a pretty consistent fact in the data. However, you know, there are a lot of other, um, there are a lot of other factors that correlate with that. And so, it's very hard to say things, to, it, it is hard slash impossible in, in the sort of context of the data we have to make statements that would sound anything like, you know, having only one parent is like inherently bad as opposed to it's correlated with other things um, that are, um, you know, that are, that are risky. And so it's just not a very good, it's not a very good data space. And the answer is almost certainly depends a lot on like the other things that are going, they're going on in the world or in your, in your household. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, from the chat. Uh, so this is probably not our last pandemic. People have been warning about a pandemic like this for quite some time, but we seemed totally unprepared. Uh, do you have any optimism that the next pandemic will be any better? Um, and what can we do to be um, better at it than this last one? Um, hope springs eternal that we'll do a better job. Um, I was reading, I've been reading Scott Gottlieb's new book, uh, which is very, very good, um, which has some ideas, ideas on this, or really just like crib, crib from him. I mean, I think if we sort of said like, what are the mistakes that we made? Um, there are, there are many, um, but I think the, um, uh, I think that the, um, the sort of main, The, the main thing was not having flexibility, not having, um, not being, not having anybody in the, in the sort of governmental space who was able to like say, I'm going to be in charge of this. And we sort of see that over and over again. Um, uh, that, that sort of the, uh, the, we needed our institutions to be more flexible and they weren't. 
Um, and that is, I think, why we ended up with all of these individual you know, people collecting data and, and doing the analysis and developing the tests and doing all this stuff, doing all this kind of advocacy, because we're sort of like plodding along in the in the federal government. So I think, you know, there, people have suggested, well, okay, we need more of a like a standing like response team, not just for pandemic, but for other things, like some people whose job is would be to coordinate other people. Um, and, you know, I think that would be, um, that would be great. You know, I don't know whether that's, I don't know whether that's going to happen. I think that's probably the best idea I would have. A uh, couple of uh, Brown questions here. What is Brown doing uh, this fall um, for vaccinations? Are they requiring it? Um, are you kicked out if you're not vaccinated? Do you know anything about the university's um, protocol? And then another one about um, your data. When you say our data, is it the Watson Institutes? Is it Brown's? Is it yours? Someone's wanting clarification on that. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll answer the data question first, which is um, which is R is like the COVID school data hub, and there are a lot of people who work on this. Um, it's not it's not Brown, um, but it is um, it's a it's a grant funded enterprise. A lot of initially we're working with Qualtrics, we're working with school superintendents, but I guess I I mean the the COVID school data hub, me and my team and other of those people. Um, what is Brown doing? So we, uh, we have a vaccine, uh, with vaccine requirement. Um, you can um, get exemption, although uh, not many people have. Uh, we are fully on campus, like fully in person. Everybody's in the classes all the time. Um, masking in all indoor spaces, although you can take your mask off to teach, I think. I'm not teaching this semester. Um, and we are testing everybody twice a week, even though they're all fully vaccinated. Cool. Uh, back to the Louise again, John. So, yeah. So Emily, I realize that you just got done writing a book, but I'm curious, are you going to write another book like on high school years and then maybe on grandparenting? I'm a, I'm a grandparent. So, you know, I'm wondering if you plan on continuing to, to do these books. In yeah. The I, I, you know, I don't know, like writing books is a lot of work. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on that. Last night I was with my parents and they were like, all of our friends think you should write a book on aging parents. And then they were like going through like different pieces of data I could have in the book. What's the right kind of nursing home? You know, should you like, like there's a lot of data on hip fractures. <laughs> it's like, okay, so maybe it will be a book about hip fractures, <laughs> but I don't know. Okay, great, thanks. That's awesome. Um, I'm trying to catch up on the chat here. Oh, a, a question here about flu, you know, that last winter there wasn't much flu and uh, I don't, I, it looks like they're asking what was going on with that. Um, should we be anxious on the impact of flu and COVID-19? I'm not sure what quite is being asked, but that's the gist of yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it's, so it's, so the, the sort of flu last year is totally fascinating because there was, there was no flu. Right. And, you know, typically in a typical year, we would see something like, you know, 300 pediatric flu deaths and we saw one, one or two. Um, and so that is just like, like we just did not have a, have a flu season. Um, you know, what was going on there? Well, I think it's almost certainly the case that like the kinds of distancing and, you know, masking and in some cases not having kids in school, although I think that probably is not, um, it's probably more important for flu than for, than for COVID, although we didn't see much flu even in places where people were in school. So you know, I think some combination of the distancing and masking was effective against, um, you know, against the flu. I think that that what's what sort of interesting, what I what I think is interesting, or what I'm wondering about, is as we sort of go forward, having now realized basically we could have a season with almost no flu. You know, there are a lot of sacrifices we're not going to be willing to make to to achieve that. I wonder whether there are some things that will persist, some COVID precautions that will persist. Uh, into into flu season, the, the one I think is most likely is sort of masking of kids in, in schools, um, in, not indefinitely, not at all times, but you know during a flu outbreak. Um, uh, but you know, my guess is we just go back to normal. I, well, the other thing I'll say about the flu is that that the the technology that they use to produce the COVID vaccines um, is a way to make flu vaccines that are infinitely better than what we've had before. Like the problem with flu vaccines is that they're slow, that you have to like guess what the strain will be because it takes a really long time to make a traditional vaccine. And if it's not a good match, then it's not very protective. You can make an mRNA vaccine in like 42 days. 
um, from, you know, like having the sequence to, to giving people shots. And that's going to mean that our flu vaccine, you know, in, in two years, our flu vaccines are going to be quite a lot better. That's great. Uh, so last uh, stretch of questions here, and it's one or two, um, you know, we're trying to just really, like everyone else, um, ramp up women in finance, um, women in STEM. Here we're the land grant for the state of North Dakota and uh, are keenly aware that we need more female engineers and more female scientists. And uh, there's a literature about just culture of women in the sciences and in economics, it's really um, been exposed just how um, crushing some of the experiences are for women in seminars and the way they're treated. And wondering if you have any comments on you know, women out there who might be interested in a career like yours, um, you know, what, how much work is involved, but also, uh, you know, how to, how, how to do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, economics, I, I, I am an economist because I, I love it. Um, you know, I love the ideas. I love the, the data. I have always loved it. I will say I have largely had really positive experiences um, with, colleagues of all of the, of all of the genders. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do on, on gender and other types of, uh, other types of, of diversity. And I think part of what's, um, you know, part of, part of what's hard is to, is to sort of talk about how we can, how those of us who are more senior can sort of effectuate, um, effectuate change and also to recognize the slow in some ways how slow it is. So, you know, my, my mother is an economist too. My mother is a PhD economist. And there are parts of our experience that are really similar. And then there are parts that are really different. And there, there are sort of parts where I, you know, I feel like, okay, like, you know, well, at least that did, that's not happening so much, so much anymore. Um, but, but, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have, we have work to do. And I, I, I do think the modeling piece is, is very important. So I think a lot about, you know, kind of what, as we promote other women, we have a responsibility to, um, you know, show that like, you know, you can be an economist and, and, you know, wear cool shoes. And I think this is, you know, for, for me, there was a, there was a panel about women in economics and with uh, a lot of very impressive people, Susan A.P., uh, Janet Yellen. And thing that really stuck with me was Susan A.P. explaining that before she got tenure, she wore really dowdy shoes. And that that was because it was like, you know, I don't want to be like a, like a lady who wears like fun, you know, fun, like cool shoes. And like, I want people to take me seriously. And then after she got tenure, she started wearing cooler shoes. Um, and I think somehow we've got to get to the point. And I like, I do the same thing. Like I, and after I got tenure, I started wearing a lot more purple. Um, and so I think somehow we've got to get to the point where, uh, where it's okay to wear the cool shoes, like before you have tenure. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, not the shoes itself, but I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but I'm, you know, we're working on it. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm going to leave it there and uh, just want to thank you for uh, the generosity of your time. I know you're uh, ridiculously busy and uh, thank you for what you're doing um, on a daily basis to just bring a bit of sanity and sensibility to, um, you know, the, the COVID issue, but also to uh, dads like me who are just trying to do our best. You know, I think uh, um, you're a huge hit here in North Dakota. You need to come out and uh, see us. You have oh my gosh, I'm going to bring the kids out. We're going to yeah. like go and do all the stuff in North Dakota. It'll be it'll awesome. Be well, yeah, and, and cross some states off. So come and see us. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being our guest today. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Take care.